Before we get to the movie, I want to pat myself on the back for finally watching a movie that I've mean to watch for years. Ah, uh, go on. It is the John Sayles film, Mate One. Probably my favorite John Sayles film. It co-stars Mr. James Earl Jones, mm -hmm. who, as you know, I'm a fan of, and I have a kind of a special connection to him. I look at him as a father of sorts. Yes. And it got me thinking about different franchises that can be explored with the James Earl Jones voice. <laughs> so I called my contacts at Disney, and I'm proud to say that they're now developing a little project called Lego Matewan. It's a light-hearted, more comical take on the Matewan West Virginia coal strike and the subsequent massacre. Yes. I will be providing the voice of Two Clothes Johnson. <laughs> Doing my best. There's going to be a little Lego Chris Cooper running around there trying to unionize those miners. That's right. Making sure that those Baldwin Phelps stooges aren't getting up to their mischief. Why, I think I see a little Lego Will Oldham <laughs> yes. dropping a pipe bomb down mine shaft number four. That's right, a young Will Oldham where he has some hair on top. <laughs> so I'm very excited about this project and I'm very excited that I could take part in making it happen. Lego Mary McDonald too? Oh, yes. All right, then I'm watching that thing. I've got a bunch of movies that I've never seen before. You don't know what they are. Every episode, I'm going to spring one on you. It might be good. It might be bad. We'll watch it and talk about it. Welcome to The Basement. This is our third episode in April, and I don't know if you've noticed, but April has had a theme. I wonder if you can guess what that theme is. Now, we watched King Arthur. We watched Explorers. They're all thematically linked, but in a rather unconventional way. Um, they are... You're not gonna guess. I'll tell you. Okay. As you know, our Hall of Fame is made up of lots of actors and directors and people like that. And generally, the criteria for that is they've appeared at least twice on our show. But some Hall of Fame members have not. Such as Mads Mikkelsen and River Phoenix, who have now made two appearances in the month of April. This is the theme. This is the theme. So, get ready for tonight's movie, which is all about a computer that goes insane. But this isn't War Games. This isn't The Terminator. This came out way before both of those films. It is Colossus, the Forbin Project. <clears throat> Released in 1970. CTFP was directed by Joseph Sargent and stars Susan Clark, Gordon Pinsett, and Eric Braden, who is best known for his 40-plus year run as Victor Newman on the daytime drama The Young and the Restless. The movie also features veteran voice actor and three-time Basement alum Paul Fries and Basement Hall of Famer James Hong. James Hong! Parts of this movie were filmed in Berkeley, California, so I thought that your gift today should give you a little taste of the Bay Area. Yeah, I've never been to the Bay Area. Oh, but I got myself a trolley car! Ding, ding! I think it's got a little bell in it that's supposed to ding, but I'm pretty sure it's broken. It's got a rattle in it. Yeah. Are we going to go to the land of make-believe here? That's right, and we hope you'll join us over on the old leather couch and make believe that the events of this film are actually happening as they are watched. <laughs> Because it is Colossus, the Forbin Project. Jungle, 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 jungle. Known in Canada as Colossus, the Forbin Project. <laughs> Before this was released on VHS, it was released on a series of punch cards. Wow. Oh. Yeah. Oh, this damn machine won't stop beeping. Check out this facility. It's really state-of-the-art. And there's one guy in charge of it, Dr. Charles A. Forbin. Glad we're getting the full scope of how long it takes to close this door. <laughs> danger, danger! <laughs> Radiation! When we kill, so when we touch. He's the man behind the Forbin Project. Colossus. It's this massive defense computer. And make certain that nuclear war never happens. Mr. President, all systems are activated. I hope I didn't keep you waiting too long. We have a very slow door. And it's perfect because it's a computer and not subject to the flaws of human logic. Now all we have to do is tell the people about it. <laughs> the people are notoriously reasonable, so we don't think it'll be a problem. 
and the president goes on television and tells everybody, hey, Colossus is a computer. We're turning it on now. And everything is going to be just fine. Deciding if an attack is about to be launched upon us. If it did decide that an attack was imminent, Colossus would then act immediately. I was elected on the platform of sleep-inducing. <laughs> the computer center, which monitor all electronic transmissions, such as microwaves, laser. Great, so I turn on my microwave and the government knows. <laughs> the entire system is surrounded by fields of intensified gamma radiation. You'll all be hulks in no time. We'll, we'll be a society of hulks, incredible hulks. Forbin gets on the horn and talks to his colleagues. Angela and I have decided to get married. Oh! We're going to name our baby Colossus. And if it's a boy, we'll name him Jared. What's this? A warning? Or is it just a warn? <laughs> warn. There is another system. What does this mean? They get on the horn with the Russian premier, and he says, uh, we have our own Colossus. It is called Guardian. It is the same type of computer. It controls all of our missiles. I'm as surprised as you guys are. You can see it on my face. <laughs> I am as surprised as you guys are. Where is Grover? He's coming, Mr. President. Grover is coming. <laughs> Back at HQ, Colossus wants to communicate with Guardian, and no one can really stop it from doing so. This scene is electric. I, I mean, it's electronic. Yeah. Colossus starts talking to Guardian and starts transmitting multiplication tables. Really basic stuff. Now that the Russians have our multiplication tables, they're coming up with their own version of Schoolhouse Rock. It is called uh, School Gulag <laughs> Dirge. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Grabber. Grabber, 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 grabber. And within hours, they're up to the most complex calculus known to man. They figured out all of math. Colossus and Guardian are an unstoppable force. Yes, Mr. President. Charlie Watts going on. Charlie Watts, he's the drummer for the Rolling Stones, sir. The president talks to the Russian premier, and they both agree. We gotta get these two to stop talking to each other. We're gonna cut off their lines of communication to establish dominance. Warn. Colossus starts trying to find alternate ways to talk to Guardian. He knows geography and math. I want communication to be reestablished with Guardian right now, or I will take action. Whoa, no! It's going to blow up an oil field in Russia. Guardian has retaliated. Retaliated? From a missile aimed towards Texas. Okay, I'm just going to say it now. I think computers might be a bad idea. At the last minute. Communications are restored. Intercept Guardian missile target enters in the Air Force base. Colossus is able to knock the Soviet missile out of the sky. Guardian, unfortunately, is not able to. The oil complex has been destroyed. Russians are not happy. Get Kubrick. Kubrick? Yeah, he'll know what to do. <laughs> yeah, he's dealt with this before. Crazy computer and nuclear war. Get some sort of Lolita or Spartacus in there. He's in charge. <laughs> Forbin and the Russians get together in Rome to have a meeting. Colossus finds out about this meeting and says, where's Forbin? Attention. Yes? If you don't bring Forbin back to me, action will be taken. I'm Colossus. I can do these things. Guardian and Colossus don't want the U.S. and the Russians to meet. So they sabotage the meeting. By killing this guy, this Russian guy. No, what happened? What happened? And they say, Just like talk Russian. The computers have decided that Forbin will be under complete monitoring forever. So he can't go sneaking around behind their backs trying to turn them off. We're going to install cameras everywhere so I can see you wherever you go. Forbin gets to take one last walk outside and he's with his people and they concoct a plan. I'm going to convince Colossus that I need a woman to please me nightly, and I need privacy to do this. We will talk, and Colossus won't be able to hear us, because he'll think we're doing the nasty. Forbin is in his apartment. He makes a martini. A martini. That's it. Get the computer drunk. Wait for it to pass out. I'm pouring that into this glass. Add an olive. Cheers. 
And now I drink gin from the bottle. Blah, 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 blah. I need a mistress. Cleo Markham, my colleague. She's my mistress. How often do you need the woman? Colossus asks. Four days a week. Ooh, I want your love in four nights a week. But I'm blowing up Sri Lanka. All right, is that cool? Cleo comes over for their first date. Hello, darling. Nothing. They act as though they've known each other forever, that they go way back, and the computer's watching the entire time. Oh, you yes, such a thing about his martini. It has to be extra dry or else. Yes, I know. I was here when he made it before. First martini I ever made. It almost ended our relationship right then and there. How so? I poured the gin over the ice, then poured the gin off, and then added vermouth. Ha 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 like this? Is this? This good? This is good dancing? Mmm. Yes, do it. <laughs> Colossus makes them take off all their clothes in front of all the cameras so Colossus can see their naked bodies. No, we can't take anything into the bedroom. Not even a pack of cigarettes. What? No smokes? <laughs> and then they go into the bedroom and they get into bed. The computer turns off the cameras, and then plans are made. But you know when they're naked in that bed all that time, that's not going to stay platonic. You know they're going to get it on. He's Charles Forbin, for God's sake. Hubba hubba. We need to make it so the missiles are useless. So Colossus thinks he can launch the missiles, but he actually can't. This plan will take approximately three years to implement. Colossus speaks. This is the voice of Colossus. All missiles in the USA and in the USSR will be allocated new targets. Because I want to take over the world. This is perfect. We're going to recalibrate all these missiles. We're going to put our dummy guidance systems in there that don't actually work, and that's how we'll get Colossus. Yes, sir. As I was saying, the uh, Russians are stalling on that complex 321s. Those Russians are always stalling. The computer does start to get suspicious. Johnson, Fisher, you are fools. Rock, rock, the planet, rock, don't stop. And starts implementing some executions. I want to be free, Colossus. That is part of man's will to live. And woman's too, maybe. And even the sex with the lady doesn't make him feel better. Yes, sir. Excuse me, Dr. Forbin. Something extraordinary is happening. What is it? Colossus is to turn on all graphic devices and is producing drawings. The construction of the project will entail blasting into the Isle of Crete. I remember the blankets like that that had that edge, the, the shiny edge blankets. I remember those. They don't make those anymore. Colossus has a vision for the future of mankind. This is the voice of world control. I'm in charge. Obey me and live, or disobey and die. I will not permit war. It is wasteful and pointless. He detonates two nuclear missiles, one in California and one in Russia. Under my absolute authority, problems insoluble to you will be solved. Like the computer problem we have? <laughs> but... You, the humans, are not going to have any more free will. And don't get mad, because really... Freedom is an illusion. And the reality is that Colossus is making it happen. And Forbin, in defiance, says, Colossus, I'll never work with you. But he knows that resistance is futile, to coin a phrase. Enjoy your new god. Enjoy your new world. Colossus is triumphant. Colossus, the Forbin Project. And we'd like to thank our YouTube audience for watching this. This may be our last transmission. <laughs> I really like this movie. I know it starts out as the worst case of laying out exposition maybe ever, but I like the turns it took, and I like that humanity lost. I like this movie in spite of the movie. Yeah. I think it would probably work better as a novel, which it was based off of a novel. Humans seem almost robotic, and the only interesting character is the computer. But as the movie goes on, and they become more at odds with each other, 
that humans gain their humanity. That does not excuse the dullness of Eric Braden's performance. He is a bit of a... What's his name? George Lazenby. Yeah. When the the role required is Sean Connery. Yeah. So much of the movie, particularly the first hour, Mm -hmm. is just leaden. It's all of this clicking and clacking and beeping and booping and flashing lights. Yeah. It's just way too... Way more of it than necessary. And this slow techno babble that doesn't make any sense. It could have used a real good script doctor coming in. Some young William Goldman who could be like, okay, we just have to make this into scenes instead of conversations. I love that they do acknowledge that it is being worshipped by the end. They have just that one little close-up of the the kid kid wearing the t-shirt. The t-shirt, yeah, I did notice that. The ending definitely had subtleties that the beginning of the movie could have used. Something I observed late in the movie was that the soundtrack seemed different than at the beginning. At the beginning, it seemed more technical. But at the end, when they're implementing the plan, it becomes much more peppier. It's like a caper soundtrack Mm -hmm. all of a sudden. Yeah, I didn't think that worked. You don't think it worked? Not really. It didn't feel right. It was showing that the humans were getting their humanity back. We aren't this leaden species and that we are going to strive and we're going to win. I could see that as being sort of a signal to the audience of like, oh, now things are turning around, folks. It's good. They're, they're going to beat that computer. And mm-hmm. then in the end, nope. Nope. <laughs> he can't beat the computer. So John Sargent directed this and you told me that he went on to better things. He directed The Taking of Pelham 123. Which is... Amazing. It's a brilliant movie. Yeah, there's three years after this. Talk about a movie with a a plot that runs like a clock. Mm-hmm. What do they expect for the 35 cents? Do they want to live forever? <laughs> you know who's in this movie? James Hong. James Hong was in the movie. For decades, James Hong was just the Asian guy in the movie. You need the scientist. You need the guy working the walk. He's the one that you hire. The movie attempts to have a somewhat multicultural cast, but Mm -hmm. doesn't give them anything to do. No. Except get killed by a firing squad. There is a line from Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. Why man, he doth bestride the narrow world like a colossus, while we petty men walk neath his huge legs and peep about to find ourselves dishonorable graves. And I think that's basically the plot of this movie. Hmm. Caesar is threatening to become a dictator, so they have to kill him. Colossus is threatening to become a dictator, and they lose. Colossus, the Forbin project, has been concluded. If you haven't seen it, take a look. And now, you can take a look at Seen It. Seen It. Russell Qualls, the Sparks Brothers. Seen It. Not yet. I think Edgar Wright made a very good decision to make it too long. Because if you are a fan of Sparks, or if you're someone like me who is interested in them and want to see more, you're not going to care how long the movie is. And if you're someone who's not one of those people, you're not going to watch it, whether it's long, short, or whatever. So Edgar Wright said, I'm just going to give them all the time they need. They've had a 40-year career. 25 albums. He does album by album by album. And I think it's a really good choice. I did. It did take me two sittings to watch the movie. But I'm glad that it was as long as it was. Do, 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 do. Pedro Halanda. Drive my car. Knock me sideways. I'd love to hear what you guys have to say about the use of Chekhov in it, in addition to how the plays were staged. I could have been another Schopenhauer. I could have been another Dostoevsky. But I watched Drive My Car. I watched the first half of it, and yeah. I thought I would go back to it the next night. And then I thought, no, I'll go back to it the next night. And then, no, I'll go back to it the next night. And now it's been around two and a half, three weeks, and I have no desire to go back to it. I had the opposite opinion. I liked it quite a bit. I liked the idea of language, like there's a language that's beneath our language, and it's not the words we say, it's different. Mm -hmm. And the idea of tragedy and the transformative power of tragedy, and how pain changes you and sometimes pain can change you in good ways but deny the denial of pain and the pushing away of pain only prolongs the pain and it prevents that transformation so i thought those themes were really fascinating and were something i connected with we have a couple of screeners here from my actors union that is the sag union and i have respect seen it seen it this is the story of aretha franklin ironically i think this movie suffers from a bit too much respect The filmmakers are so adoring of the subject that I think they sacrifice quality for reverence. 
the first hour, the, okay, this story pops when Aretha meets Wexler at Muscle Shoals. Mm -hmm. That's when the story takes off. That should happen in the first 20 minutes of the movie. It should not happen an hour into the movie. The first hour of this is a very detailed depiction of that type, part of her life, but it's not that interesting, and yeah. they spend too much time on it. Mm -hmm. It's so the first res nine albums where she has not had a hit. She hasn't found herself. So they're respecting her journey so much that they're giving us this part of this movie that's just not very good. Jennifer Hudson was boring, and then she is completely destroyed by the closing credits where they show a very old Aretha Franklin singing, and it is the most powerful thing you've ever seen in your entire life yeah. and you're watching people in the audience cry and it's like oh look they're doing that thing i didn't do once in this movie <laughs> we have this one the tragedy of macbeth denzel washington and francis mcdormand seen it thrice the brindled cat hath mewed i have seen it we of course have a history with this material that's true we got to know each other during the production of macbeth i have quite a history of this material the first play i was ever in was macbeth oh playing a small supporting role with Thane of Angus. One of the last plays I was in was Macbeth, where I got to play the lead. So oh. that was really bookends for my acting career. I played Lennox. We could have had a scene together. The <laughs> scene where they're like, yeah, nothing's going on here, right? That scene? We had a scene together in our production where you're you're crowned the Prince of Cumberland and I look at you. You scour at me. Yeah. <laughs> I really didn't like the style of the speaking. It was way too conversational. And I think they really just flattened all the poetry out of it by making it seem like a screenplay. Shakespeare is not a script. Shakespeare is poetry. And you have to speak it like that. Mm -hmm. But when you just talk it like, you know, when we're just talking like this and you say Shakespeare in this, this type of tone and you're talking like this, it just, it doesn't, it doesn't work for me. You have to find the balance between conversational and poetry. It's hard for me not to just not talk about the movie and just tell stories about the production of Macbeth mm -hmm. that we were in. So that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> My favorite scene in the play is where Macbeth is talking to the two murderers and telling them they have to go kill Banquo. Yeah. And he's telling them, you need to do this because Banquo has been doing all this mean stuff to you. Yeah. And, and the reason why your lives suck mm -hmm. is because of Banquo. It's just a great actor scene. Wants and needs and tactics and manipulation. I did this scene in, in our production. Our friend uh, Doug Steckel was in that. Yes. And in the middle of the run, someone told me, it might have been you, Doug has endowed his character with the backstory that he is a child murderer. <laughs> and I found this out, and I was like, ah. And so that night, the middle of the run, I'm doing that speech, and then I was like, you know, it's Banquo. Banquo's out here. You have to kill him. Fleance, his son, is also with him. <laughs> and Doug looks at me and goes... <laughs> It was just, it's one of my favorite moments I've ever had on stage. There's a little computer project you can get involved with, and that's going to our website, welcome to thebasementshow.com. All of our episodes are there, the entire catalog, and there are also PayPal donation buttons that you can click on and make a one time or rolling monthly donation to support our show. This is something you can do if you like our show. And if you like using computers, you can trust them. One of our donors is David, who says, Happy birthday, Matt. Thanks, David. Here's a little scratch to go towards that new oscillator. Mmm. We're finally going to be able to track down the bad guys. <laughs> if you want to know what that comment means, you can watch our White Heat episode. Also, you can watch the next unboxing, which comes out this coming Friday. More Craig and Matt chat and more surprises. And right now, you can take a look at this. That is Mrs. Cunningham, isn't it? Marion Ross. That's they should bring in the Fonz, and he can just go up to Colossus and be like... <laughs> <laughs> and then it would start working correctly, take out the Soviets, and also play the new hit by the Big Bopper. <laughs> Obey me and live, or disobey and die.